Good afternoon to everybody, and, and thank you for being here with us, and welcome to this uh, uh, ESU organized webinar. Uh, my name is Alberto Breda, and I work at Fundación Puigverta in Barcelona. The aim of my talk today is going to give you some uh, um, insight into the world of robotic-assisted uh, renal transplantation, and uh, in order to do this, uh, I'll try to give you some ideas on how we were able to develop a robotic kidney transplantation program. I'll try to give you some uh, information on the step-by-step -step procedure, which is, I think, the, one of the most challenging part, um, and then give you some uh, tips and tricks. Um, so we um, should say that kidney transplantation, as you all know, is the preferred uh, treatment for patients with end-stage renal disease. Uh, and we all know this. And the reason why um, um, kidney transplantation is very delicate is because our patients are fragile, immunocompromised, uh, and with an increased risk of uh, perioperative complications. And so, so um, starting from this point, a uh, um, um, few years ago, we started to think on a way to minimize the morbidity uh, to our patients. And in fact, uh, uh, we started to um, hear people uh, that were performing robotic um, kidney transplantation. Um, I have to tell you that the experience uh, starts thank thanks to the Americans uh, um, and also to uh, people from India. And I would underline uh, most likely the first uh, uh, robotic kidney transplantation uh, uh, that was published uh, uh, was from a group from Chicago, from general surgeons. Uh, this was Professor Giulianotti, uh, and that again is from a group from Chicago. But then uh, um, he was followed by a group of uh, Manny Menon and Rajesh Alawat, who are the guys that you see um, uh, 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 with the red circle on top of the right uh, image. Uh, these guys were really the pioneers. Uh, and they were really the people that studied intensively uh, um, the, the robotic kidney transplant uh, and the effects on the kidney, as well as the results on uh, um, uh, kidney transplantation. Um, after that, uh, and these were the pioneers again, the experience was also brought to Europe. Uh, um, and the first uh, guy that really uh, started a robotic kidney transplant in Europe uh, was Professor Boggi from the University of Pisa and he did the anastomosis of the vessels robotically but then he opened uh, to do the ureteral reimplantation. You have to think that this was 2011 and there was really little on robotic kidney transplantation. But these are the pioneers uh, that led us uh, uh, to start uh, the real true robotic uh, um, um, kidney transplantation in, in Europe. Uh, and on the same date, uh, on the 9th of July, both Nicolas Dumerck from the University of Toulouse and ourselves from Fundación Puigverte performed uh, the first uh, robotic assisted kidney transplantation completely done robotically in uh, Europe. Uh, and of course the results were very good and you see in here mother to daughter, there was a lot of interest around this uh, uh, procedure um, and, uh, and since then uh, we've been performing this uh, at our institution uh, in recipients from living donors. The living donor is still performed laparoscopically. Uh, this is an example of how we perform the donor uh, with five millimeter instruments and then we extract the kidney via a small penicillin incision. And then here we start with the preparation of the kidney. You see here myself uh, and, and Dr. Angelo Territo is my fellow. And, um, and uh, you see here that we are on the bench table preparing the kidney. This is one of the first uh, crucial steps in preparing the kidney for the transplantation. You see here on the image on the left up um, of the monitor that the kidney is totally prepared and once the ureter is spatulated uh, and the fat is kept, uh, um, the periureteral fat is kept, uh, one thing that I found very advantageous is to place the double J stent in already at this step. 
So then you don't have to do it robotically, which at times can be very tricky. And then it, as you, you see at the bottom uh, on the left screen, uh, the go, it, 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 we prepare a 4 by 4 which is a ghost like, uh, like you see down there, and we make a hole in the middle of the gauge. So then we pour the kidney directly in there and the vessels uh, can come out uh, from that hole and the kidney can be kept inside of this jacket that we will prepare filled with ice slush. As you can see in here, uh, you see the kidney totally prepared uh, on the left, which is a sort of a um, uh, jacket uh, that we, 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 we make. Um, and this jacket is filled with ice slush. So then the kidney is kept cold during the entire surgery. You have to keep in mind that when we do this robotically, we insert the kidney inside the abdominal cavity transperitoneally, and then we close the abdominal cavity such that uh, there's a high temperature that normally we're not used to, to have in an open procedure. The temperature is around 38 degrees. So I'll show you later on how to down uh, to make the to make the temperature lower inside the abdomen so that we can keep the the kidney cool at least below 30 degrees and do the transplant uh, success successfully. So first of all, to do this, uh, we have to prepare uh, what we call regional hypothermia. This has been described already, and in fact, we copy exactly the step by step described by many men on Rajesh Alawat. Um, and you see in here, it's crucial to prepare um, uh, many of these modified tumor syringes uh, in which the tip is cut and then we fill the syringes with, uh, with crushed ice uh, and then once the patient is opened, we pour a lot of this ice inside the abdomen so then we cool the intra-abdominal cavity before we insert the kidney. Once the kidney is inserted by a, a small periumbilical incision, we, we, we place a gel point on top of this incision and we adapt the gel point like you see in these images for the syringes to be introduced. And you see here you need to make a transversal incision in the gel point so that the, the, the syringe can, can, can be inserted with no air leak and then via this gel port you can drop constantly ice on top of the kidney during your anastomosis. I tell you that this is the, one of the most important things because you certainly don't want to have the kidney exposed to high temperature during your um, uh, vascular anastomosis. Uh, that could be potentially dangerous and therefore by dropping constantly crashed ice inside the abdomen and on top of the kidney, we uh, have already demonstrated uh, and Dr. Rajesh Alawat and many men have done intensive study on this uh, that the kidney stays as a, at a constant temperature below 30 degrees uh, which is ideal in the transplant environment. You see here the trocar position is uh, more or less like a trocar position for a robotic prostatectomy or cystectomy. The only thing is that your left end, the robotic left end, uh, it's a little bit in the direction of the right iliac crest. So there is a little bit of rotation of the robotic arms uh, uh, unlike a robotic prostatectomy. But for the rest, uh, it's, as you can see here, exactly the same trocar position as for a robotic prostatectomy. Um, and you don't have to go in a very steep trend Ellenberg. In fact, uh, there's only a 20 to 30 percent, 20 to 30 degrees trend Ellenberg position. After that, once we dock the robot, uh, um, uh, we start with the dissections of, of, of the iliac artery and vein, as you see here in the monitor. Um, and uh, we really want to dissect the vessels uh, extensively. Um, there's no um, um, risk of uh, developing uh, um, um, lymphocele uh, due to the fact that we are intraperitoneal. And so, unlike in open surgery where you want to dissect as minimal as possible the vessels, in this surgery you want to really uh, skeletonize the artery, the, the external iliac artery and external iliac vein. So then you can really have access to the vessels uh, and you can really clamp your vessels uh, in the right manner. Keep in mind that we are doing robotic surgery and therefore there's no tactile feedback uh, and therefore you really want to have the vessels exposed in the best situation. 
you see in the image in the upper right quadrant uh, that the vessels are dissected and on the left uh, you see the kidney inside its jacket uh, and prepared to be anastomosed. After that we make uh, and we prepare, you see in the, in the lower quadrant, uh, we prepare the, incision, uh, the, the bladder and we make a, a small incision uh, to expose the mucosa and we really do exactly like we do in open uh, so, so that we prepare the mucosa and the detrusor muscle for leach Gregoire um, anastomosis. And you see these are crucial steps uh, that are important to prepare before the kidney is entered. We also place here a pouch, uh, I'm sorry, we also prepare a retroperitoneal pouch in which the kidney will be flipped in and uh, then we will, be, we will close the, 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 the pouch with a couple of emulocs so then the kidney is retro, <coughs> retroperitonealized. And only at this point when the vessels are ready, when the, the bladder is ready and when the retroperitoneal pouch is ready, we make the incision, periumbilical incision as you see in here and as you see on the right lower quadrant, uh, this is a four finger incision uh, or a six centimeter incision. That's just enough to introduce the kidney. And once that's done, uh, we close again with the gel point as I showed you in the beginning uh, and the procedure starts. You see here that uh, the, the, the incision has been done, the gel point is, has been placed uh, and you see here the kidney is introduced. Once the kidney is introduced, it is capped the abdominal cavity with the gel point, and then we dock the robot, and the procedure can start. So the procedure starts again with the anastomosis. That's why you want to have your vessels already prepared before the kidney is introduced. Once it's introduced, as you see in here, and you can find the nice details both in the European Urology paper from many men in Rajesh Alawat, and in our paper from the World Journal of Urology, um, you will find the details of the technique. But here you see that we start with a venous anastomosis, uh, and here you see the Scanlan bulldogs, uh, which are the robotic bulldogs that are very useful in this kind of surgery, um, and, and you see the iliac vein, uh, the external iliac vein that is clamped. At this point, uh, the venotomy is performed, the iliac vein is flashed with some saline and then we can start the vascular anastomosis. You see in here we are doing exactly the same things that we would do open. So for instance uh, going uh, step by step you see on top of on the left uh, we're using a 6-0 Gore-Tex and that's because this, this suture has no memory and therefore it's easy to be used and we go outside in, inside out, so outside in in the iliac vein and then inside out in the renal vein. And then we start, we, we tie the knot and then we start running the um, uh, suture, um, as you can see in here, first on the posterior wall of the vein and then we turn and we go to the anterior wall of the vein, um, so then uh, you will have at the end, as you see in here on the right lower quadrant, uh, the entire anastomosis performed. At this point uh, you clamp the renal vein and then you declamp the iliac artery such that you would do exactly the same in open surgery. At this point uh, we clamp the uh, external iliac artery and we start with the arterial anastomosis. So you see in here again on the left the kidney inside his jacket and you see some eyes. This is very important because after the venous anastomosis that normally takes 15 to 18 minutes, we pour some eyes on top of the kidney so then we can do our arterial anastomosis in a very safe and relaxed manner. You see here that the venotomy is performed, I'm sorry, the arteriotomy is performed and you can do that with scissors or with the robotic scalpel. But then I think it's very important to have a punch an arterial punch. I like this in open surgery and I use the same in robotic surgery. And the punch is a 3-0 or a 4-0 depending on what you prefer. I normally use a 3-0 punch and this is very important because it gives you a round hole. Like you see in here, the hole is, uh, I would say, very nice and the vision is excellent and therefore again you go outside, inside, in the iliac artery and then inside, outside uh, in, the in the renal artery, you tie the knot down and like for the vein, 
you start running uh, the 60 uh, Goratex uh, and you do the entire running uh, up until your artery is performed. Now you will notice here uh, that before we um, um, uh, declamp the iliac artery, we do exactly the same as we would, do, we would do in open surgery, and so we clamp the renal artery and we declamp the iliac artery, so then we look for any bleeding. And if there is no bleeding, then we go to the reperfusion. So I just want to make a comment on the iliac artery and the renal artery anastomosis. It is very easy to make a mistake at this point. You have to think that we're using either a zero or a 30 degrees camera. Especially if you use a 30 degrees camera, it is easy to rotate a little bit the camera and then you have a false image of your orientation. And therefore, you can make the arteriotomy a little bit too lateral towards the peritoneum, towards the bowel, let's say. That's dangerous because uh, if you make this mistake, then you make the entire anastomosis and it looks perfect, but then when you flip the kidney on top of the psoas, uh, you may have a kinking. Like you see here, you have an, a very acute angle and you may have a kinking. So always keep in mind uh, to make your arteriotomy towards the psoas and never towards the bowel. That's much better to have an, a, a, an arteriotomy that is too lateral than, I'm sorry, too medial than too lateral. Um, again, once the artery, as I said, is, uh, is, uh, has been performed, then we reperfuse the kidney, we cut the, the, the jacket, and you see here a perfectly reperfused kidney, and, in that, and at this point you can make your um, uh, hemostasia and then flip the kidney in on top of the psoas muscle in the pouch that you have previously prepared preparated and then you close the pouch with uh, 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 a couple of uh, hemolocks so then uh, the, the kidney is stable and is kept inside uh, the pouch. I think it's, this, this step is very important. Uh, there are people arguing that, uh, that you could leave the kidney intraperitoneally. I normally don't like this. I want to stay as similar to the open surgery as possible and I think there is a reason there are papers showing at least 50% of uh, possible kidney rotation and therefore arterial torsion if you leave the kidney free inside the peritoneum and I don't like that. And the second is that uh, uh, if there is hydronephrosis uh, or an urethral stricture and you need to go to access the kidney percutaneously, if you leave it intraperitoneally then it's certainly more difficult uh, than if you have it uh, in the retroperitoneal space. Once this is done, uh, like for a regular open uh, reimplantation, I like to do the Leach Gregoire. So we use a 4O monocryl. Uh, you can also use a 4O PDS. It's up to you. I prefer the monocryl. And we do first uh, the mucosa to mucosa on the spatulated ureter. And then we use uh, uh, to close uh, the, the chusel muscle. Uh, in an in a anti-reflux tunnel, uh, which is approximately three times longer than the spatulation length of the ureter. So if you spatulate one centimeter, your tunnel should be three centimeter long. And that could, uh, should assure you a good anti-reflux tunnel. This is nothing different, uh, that different uh, than what we would normally do for open surgery. I like to do the extra vesicle. Uh, there are people that uh, uh, like to do the Taguchi, for instance. Uh, I don't like the Taguchi, but I think it's uh, much easier, and especially at the beginning, uh, if you feel uh, more comfortable performing a Taguchi, I think there shouldn't be any uh, issues with that. Um, so um, once this is done, the surgery is uh, finished. And um, uh, what about the results? So I'm proud to say that uh, um, uh, through the IRUS uh, Society, the European Robotic Association uh, uh, Society, we um, um, uh, put together a nice group of uh, people performing robotic transplantation in Europe. And the idea is to um, um, uh, uh, come up with a perspective, uh, common perspective database uh, and give some results uh, with a one two and three year follow-up. Um, so far we have been lucky enough uh, to have uh, this center uh, involved and you see here 
there's people from Belgium, from Germany, from Italy, us from Spain, um, from France, and from England. But this is a still open recruiting uh, uh, database, and so I, I think that there will be more people joining uh, as there are more people uh, uh, performing robotic transplantation and, or starting robotic transplantation programs uh, in Europe. So far, I've been uh, happy to direct this group, uh, and uh, we were able to put together some numbers for you. Uh, this is preliminary data, unpublished, uh, so um, this is just uh, something that I would like to share with you. As you see in here, um, uh, the centers that have uh, participated with the numbers uh, um, for a total of 32 cases performed. Um, what it is very important to say and to stress is that the majority of these are coming from living donors. Uh, there are just a couple coming from uh, diseased donors. Uh, there is a reason why um, we, uh, um, we only can perform uh, uh, this surgery so far in living donors, and this is because it's an elective surgery. In, uh, in the emergency of a kidney transplant overnight, uh, it's very difficult, at least in, uh, for European centers, or at least in my center, to have access to the robot and to the team dedicated to the robotic uh, transplantation. Um, there is no doubt that, especially in the, at the beginning, you want to have your uh, scrap nurse and your assistant uh, always with you when you do this surgery, um, and, 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 and this is not always possible in the setting of a disease donor. Um, also, it is very important to stress that because of the, um, uh, the, tactile, the, the, the fact that the tactile feedback is missing uh, in robotic surgery, we have no feeling of uh, atherosclerosis of the iliac artery, and therefore it's really important to have CT scans uh, um, and, and to know that uh, the iliac artery is free of calcifications, and normally the recipients coming from limb donors are in fact uh, um, these kind of recipients with, with no atherosclerosis. Uh, um, so these are a few of the reasons why we are doing this on living donors uh, recipients, uh, but I'm, I'm sure that as the uh, experience will progress, uh, the ideal situation of having a disease donor um, recipient uh, will be our final goal. As you see in here, a few data on the overall surgical time. You see, it can vary from uh, two, three hours uh, to three, four, or five hours, uh, depending, uh, of course, uh, on the docking time, uh, on the waiting time for the living donor to come. So it really depends on uh, whether you, you use two different theaters or you use uh, the same theater one after the other. But the most important thing uh, that you have to look into is the venous uh, anastomosis time and the arterial anastomosis time. And you see in here that in here we are almost all uniform. In other words, uh, within 50 minutes, uh, uh, the majority of, of, of us can perform uh, um, the kidney transplantation. And this is really important uh, to stress because in a way you are working against time. Um, and, uh, and this is important to stress the fact that until we will have uh, a, perfect, a perfect temperature control, uh, um, and, and so far, I'm not sure if we have a perfect temperature co control. Uh, we, re we really need to be as fast as possible during the anastomosis. Going to the functional results, again, preliminary results at day seven. You see that the majority have an acceptable creatinine at, 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 at uh, discharge from the hospital. You see that there are a couple of centers with a higher creatinine. And that is because there have been a couple of delayed drug function uh, that altered uh, the, stat the statistics uh, of, the, of the creatinine. And here you see that when you look at the complication rate, uh, um, over 32 there have been two uh, kidney that have, that have been lost because of uh, arterial thinking, exactly what I was commenting to you before. The, 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 the arteriotomy was done too lateral, and therefore when we flip the kidney on top of the psoas, uh, um, and and uh, and uh, to lose at the same problem, uh, there was a kinking of the artery and uh, a thrombosis on post-operative day two. But other than these two, that are approximately seven percent uh, of uh, of kidney loss, uh, which is a little bit higher than the general uh, open uh, literature. Um, but keep in mind that this is uh, you know the the learning curve, uh, and and therefore I think that is totally acceptable. Uh, 
uh, in terms of uh, uh, kidney loss and I'm sure that uh, as time will progress this will go down. We really had a couple of uh, uh, delayed drug function and I think that uh, this is uh, the only concern that I really have um, and uh, uh, we are not expecting uh, a 10 to 15 percent uh, of delayed graft function uh, in open surgery and I think that, that this delayed graft function uh, is again uh, something that we need to reflect on and it's possibly related uh, to either the longer ischemia time, warm ischemia time or the fact that uh, there's uh, a double effect on pneumoperitoneum coming from the living donor so two or three hours of living donation and then two or three hours of kidney transplantation which in total is five to six hours of pneumoperitoneum and although we stay as low as possible with the pressure the, 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 the higher pressure together with a little bit of warm ischemia time may uh, result in a uh, delayed graft function. So you see here that the complication is not so high but we still have uh, something to work and I think that this will uh, eventually evolve and become much better uh, with uh, the experience and with the collaboration of other centers. Uh, it's worthless to say that of course we think that the robotic uh, um, kidney transplantation uh, adds uh, to the open surgery the superb magnification and the high degree of freedom and that I think it results in a much precise and if you will faster vascular anastomosis although this is still and yet to be demonstrated and of course there are increased cosmetic results which of course are not the main issue here but I think that with time we, we may we may and when I say we may that's really I mean we're studying it but I think that with time we may assist at lower complication rate especially lower wound infections and lower anastomotic um, problems especially in the obese population this is something that we are looking into um, there are uh, overweighted and obese recipients uh, in which you all know that their transplant uh, might be very difficult uh, and I think that is so far in this particular population the robotic uh, fits the most of course the, the should, we should expect a, a lower postoperative pain and an earlier hospital discharge uh, again I am speculating on this uh, since I still don't have uh, um, uh, uh, results uh, uh, to prove this but we as I said are working uh, extensively on this with this uh, prospective collaboration. Um, the limits of course are related to the cost, uh, luckily enough I don't have to deal with this uh, but yes with the ischemia time already we talked about this uh, we really need uh, to control the ischemia, the warm ischemia time as much as possible and there are centers including ours that are working in uh, generating uh, uh, some tools to control the, the, the warm ischemia and to keep a constant uh, uh, low temperature on the kidney. So to finalize with this 30 minutes talk, um, the take home messages for you are that robotic assisted uh, transplantation uh, is an advanced application of the technique. I think that this is not for everybody so far so you first need to have robotic skill and then you need to have transplant skill before you consider starting with this technique. Um, and so far we need to wait for prospective data to come before we can uh, um, certainly say that robotic kidney transplantation is not only the future but is the present. And I would stress the fact that the surgery in motion is working very uh, much on, uh, on uh, um, education and already has the video from us from Fundacion Puigvert on living donation and within a month you should be able to see our robotic transplantation technique step by step um, and I hope uh, that with this uh, um, uh, we can start the discussion with the questions and I thank you very much for your attention. Okay, so I have um, the first question is uh, thank you very much, excellent presentation. Do you fix the J stent with a suture? No, I don't fix the J stent with any suture. Um, in fact, we place the stent in the bench table and uh, once it's placed, uh, um, uh, we insert the kidney and we do exactly as if it was an open procedure 
um, and in a week uh, or two weeks, depending on how well the anastomosis um, has been performed, I've removed the stent uh, uh, with a regular cystoscopy. The pneumoperi there is another uh, question, pneumoperitoneum cold versus warmed CO2. This is an excellent question. Um, so you know that the majority of the people uh, performing laparoscopy, uh, they are using warm CO2 in order for the camera not to get foggy. Uh, I have to say that I always use cold uh, CO2, but particularly in the robotic kidney transplantation, you absolutely want to use cold CO2. And uh, to uh, forward this question, uh, I think that uh, um, um, one of the most interesting uh, research that we are performing right now is in using uh, the SurgeQuest technology. For those of you who are not familiar with SurgeQuest, uh, this is uh, um, a recirculating of CO2, so then you can keep the pressure very low. And we will see that with a very low and recirculating CO2, the results might be better. Um, let me see. There were much more questions. Okay. So, next question is, do you get the non-functional kidney at the same session? No, um, I don't. Normally, um, unless there is a need to remove the native kidneys, I do not remove the native kidneys. So when do I remove it? Uh, well, for instance, if there is a cancer, if there are staghorn stones or history of infections uh, or refluxing uh, kidneys, uh, um, uh, also polycystic, polycystic kidneys sometimes are a challenge. Uh, and in this situation, uh, then I remove the kidney uh, in the first at the first time, and then once the kidney is out, uh, we per we perform uh, the kidney transplantation. In rare occasions, uh, I perform uh, the nephrectomy and the transplant at the same time. This is mainly mainly in polycy polycystic kidney disease, but in this situation, uh, I don't do the, the transplant robotically. Let's see here if I can see other questions. Um, okay, so what is the risk of internal hernia if you leave a gap between the hemolog and the abdominal wall? Uh, I think that although the 100% the and 0% does not exist, uh, I think that the internal hernia it's really a minimal risk because uh, I'm sorry I couldn't show you the video uh, but in the surgery motion you will see it. Uh, at the end not only we retroperitonealize the kidney but also we retroperitonealize the bladder so we reconstruct the entire pelvic floor um, and therefore, I think that uh, there's really minimal risk of uh, internal uh, hernia development. I didn't get exactly where I should make uh, the arteriotomy. All right, so this is a little bit tricky to be described, uh, uh, but um, consider that you're entering uh, um, your 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 um, abdomen via the umbilicus. And so your vision is on top of the iliac artery. Now, whether you use a zero degrees lens or a 30 degrees lens, uh, the vision changes a little bit. So if, this is, if, the, if, if uh, you want to make your arteriotomy as you would do in open surgery, so you want to stay on top of the iliac artery, the problem is that if you are using the 30, you can rotate the 30 a little bit and then the top of the iliac artery may result to you to be very lateral. And if you do not recognize this and you make the arteriotomy lateral, then when you make the anastomosis at the beginning, everything looks perfect because the kidney is intraperitoneal. But then when you flip the kidney, then you have a kinking. So you want to make sure 100% that your arteriotomy is right on top of the artery. And if you want to make it a little bit more medial, looking at the psoas muscle, then it's per perfect because you're sure that when you flip the kidney, 
if you make the arteriotomy close to the psoas muscle, then there's not going to be any kinking. I hope that this was uh, um, clear enough. Um, let me see if I can start from the very beginning. I'm sorry, but there are, well, this was, how many robotic transplantation has, have, have you performed so far? And this is a quest, well, this is 15 robotic transplantation plus two uh, surgeries as a proctor. Dr. Breda, thank you for your nice presentation. Do you have any data regarding pain after this procedure versus open surgery and um, transplant function and late graft function compared with open surgery? Best regards. Um, okay, so uh, yes, I have some data. So uh, although, although we are using validated questionnaires, uh, this is a little bit too early to talk about uh, data after 15 procedures on, kin on pain, but as for any laparoscopic or robotic surgery, it looks like the pain on postoperative day one is exactly the same as for open surgery. But then starting from postoperative day two and three, the pain is much lower in robotic surgery. And I think that's fair. I mean, uh, that's what we would expect. Uh, again, I will give you more answers, possibly at the EAU this year, uh, most likely next year. Uh, as far as uh, um, uh, functional re regard and late graph function re compared with open, um, so far the graph function is very similar to open surgery. As I said in the beginning, uh, we, ex we, we found a little bit higher delayed graph function in the robotic kidney uh, population and I told you already what I think uh, the reason is. Um, although the late graph function, considered that we started this in uh, July 9th, 2015, uh, so we just, uh, we're just over one year of experience, uh, and at one year, the kidneys that, uh, uh, are, uh, um, that we performed, other than the one that we lost, uh, are working perfectly. So uh, 14 hours out of 15, and if we consider the two from the outside, is, six, is 16 out of 17 are working uh, very good. Um, are you planning to perform robotic transplantation from disease donor? What are the difficult? Okay, so this question I think I already answered during my talk. Uh, blood vessels, but, but yes, just to make it uh, clear, yes, I would like to start with the disease donors. I think it's a perfect operation for the disease donors. I think that the robot uh, really helps in the difficult cases. And therefore, if you have a very um, tiny recipient uh, from a perfect living donor, of course this surgery will be fine whether you do it open, robotic, or laparoscopically performed. But if you do it in an obese patient or in a morbidly, um, morbid, um, uh, with, with, in, a, in a patient with a lot of comorbidities uh, or with previous uh, um, surgeries, for instance, uh, I think that the robotic surgery can really help you here. And I think really that robots is so fine that can give you um, really uh, advantages in difficult cases. The only problem is the tactile feedback and the fact that uh, I think that so far uh, you want to be able to clamp uh, arteries uh, that are healthy arteries. So if you're dealing with uh, atherosclerosis uh, and with recipients with uh, big atherosclerotic vessels, uh, in this situation, I think it might be very uh, challenging to use the robot and to clamp. The worst thing that you, that, that you can face in robotic transplantation is that the clamp doesn't work and then you have a massive bleeding. Um, so I think that so far the experience has been in living donors, recipients, also for this reason. But yes, I think that uh, we, will, uh, we want to start with disease donors. And to be fair enough, uh, Nicolas Dumerc uh, from Toulouse uh, has done, I think, if I'm not mistaken, two uh, kidney transplantation from disease donors uh, with good success. Um, there's another question. Blood vessels anastomosis is similar to open procedure? Yes. I think that, uh, um, you know, it depends on uh, what kind of anastomosis you perform open. If you are a surgeon that is used to do um, uh, single stitches, 
so separate sutures, uh, then it's totally different to the one that we do robotically. I am used to do running sutures, uh, two hemi-continuous uh, sutures, and this is exactly the same. A little bit trickier here in, in the fact that we modified a little bit the running suture, but more or less is exactly the same as we would do in open. There's a question. We usually use uh, 6-O-Prolen in our center and not Goratex. Why do you choose Goratex? Uh? Is it for not tying or memory? Yeah, well, both. Um, more than for not tying, um, I like it because it has no memory. And in robotic surgery, um, you will see if you have done some uh, ureteric reimplantation using, using uh, the 4 monocryl, for instance, uh, you'll see that the man memory sometimes is it's a problem. Um, also, the, the, the monofilaments uh, are very delicate, uh, and it's easy to break it with a robot, and especially at the beginning, uh, um, you break sutures. Uh, um, and so the, the, the Goratex is a little bit more resistant, uh, um, and I think it works perfectly. And it's not m more expensive than the Prolin, so I think it's, um, it's a good way to start with. Um, all right, so this question I already answered. What is the risk of internal hernia? I already answered it. Um, how do you assess the graft function? Okay, so there is a question. Uh, how do you assess graft function? This is very important. One thing that I didn't mention on my presentation is that you want to have um, a, a, a Doppler ultrasound, intraoperative Doppler ultrasound. I think that especially in the, in the beginning, uh, you have to be ready to have a Doppler ultrasound check immediately after the reperfusion and then before you wake the patient up. And you want to make sure 100% that the kidney is well perfused. If you have any doubts on this, not only the color of the kidney, but also any doubts on the Doppler and you think that there's not a good perfusion, then do not excitate to open and revise the anastomosis. Uh, to be honest with you, I'm sure 100% that if, if at that time that I lost the kidney, uh, the, the Doppler ultrasound uh, would have showed me something uh, not well perfused, uh, I would have uh, performed uh, an open procedure. Problem is that that was uh, my second case, and at that time the op Doppler ultrasound was not present in the room, and so I had to rely on post-operative day one uh, urine, urine uh, um, uh, quantity and uh, creatinine, and so it was too late. Since then, I always perform Doppler ultrasound uh, immediately at reperfusion, uh, even if the color is good, uh, and before I wake the patient up, uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, I assess the creatinine, uh, the urine output, uh, consider that this normally are kidney coming from living donors, uh, and so, so they should start to produce urine uh, right away. Um, and uh, the, the, the first creatinine is done on post-operative day one at 8 a.m., and, uh, and that should be already um, uh, showing a kidney that is filtering. So this is the way I um, assess the kidney function. Uh, here I have... Uh, the question is, do you leave drain? Essentially, in open, is very rare to leave one. Um, well, uh, I disagree. Uh, I mean, I leave drain in open surgery always. Uh, um, it's it's just a matter of uh, getting used to this. Uh, I'm I've been trained this way, and I always leave a drain. Um, so I do it also for robotic surgery. Uh, but if you are confident enough. Uh, uh, that your urethral anastomosis is good, uh, you may skip the, the, the drain. The reason why I leave the drain, uh, and I leave it for three to four days, uh, it's uh, to assess for urine leak, uh, not for bleeding. It's just for the urine leak. So I like to leave it in, but uh, again, this is level of evidence uh, zero, um, and therefore uh, it's up to you. But yes, I leave a drain. Uh, this is okay. This we already answer. Okay, so there's a question. Do you always prefer to do um, an anti-reflux anastomosis for urethrovesical anastomosis? The answer is yes, unless <coughs> I have uh, a page, a recipient uh, that is anuric for quite a long time with a very small bladder 
a very thin detrusor wall. In these situations, uh, the majority of the time, uh, I just do a direct reimplantation. But that's because there's no detrusor to, to generate the anti-reflux tunnel. And the mucosa is so fragile that you want to have some support. But if I have a normal recipient, uh, such as uh, the recipients that we have uh, from uh, the living donors, uh, um, the, the, the bladder is normal, uh, normally is, uh, is, is fine. Normally, these are preemptive uh, recipients. Uh, and therefore, I always like to have an anti-reflux tunnel. I think it's really very important uh, to avoid reflux in kidney transplantation whenever possible. Um, OK, so there's a, 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 another question. How can we perform arteriotomy if we do not have a vascular punch? OK, so this is very easy. Um, if you don't have a punch, you use scissors. Um, if you don't have scissors, you use, you use a scalpel. So there's always a way to perform an arteriotomy. The reason why I like the punch is because it makes a very nice round uh, hole. And that's nice to, 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 to have it. But you can, uh, you can absolutely have the same result with the scissors. The only thing is that with scissors, it takes a little bit longer. So you're losing a little bit more time. And as I, and I said before, time is money here. And so you want to be as fast as possible. That's why you use a vascular punch. If you want to, 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 to buy a vascular punch, you should be um, uh, assured that there are vascular punch in the market that are small, medium size, and long size. Just go for the long size. Because even with the long size, sometimes you cannot reach the iliac artery. And then in that situation, you have to use scissors. Um, I have another question. If you have a case of disused bladder, say a non-functioning bladder, okay, do you consider ureter or ureter anastomosis robotically? Um, well, it depends. Normally, even if uh, the, the, the question is the bladder is not functioning because uh, um, the patient uh, before uh, getting into renal insufficiency had some uh, functional problems uh, or um, it has become like this, like a small bladder because of many years on dialysis. If the answer is A, then you need to fix the bladder more than the UU anastomosis. And so you need to make a bladder augmentation or um, whatever you, you need to do, including an iliac conduit. But if before the renal insufficiency, the patient was urinating fine, I do directly to the bladder and the bladder recovers fine. So there's no problem, even if it's a very low capacity bladder, 50 cc capacity bladder, if before the renal insufficiency the patient was fine, as soon as, as, soon as you plug the ureter to the bladder and you refunctionalize the, the bladder, in two to three months the patient will be fine. At the beginning, you have to advise the patient and inform the patient that he will have some frequency and also some urgent continence in some situations. But that's just the beginning. Um, other question, how many days the patient stays in the hospital after surgery? This varies very much. Uh, see, the, uh, if it was for the surgery solely, the patient could go home in the majority of the cases on post-operative day two or three. I just recently talked to um, uh, Jeffrey Veal, who is the chief of kidney transplantation at UCLA, where, where I trained, and he sent his patients home on post-operative day three. Um, granted, this is United States, uh, we are Europe. Um, it's a little bit different. Uh, um, but I think that the reason why my patient stays in uh, for a week, and this is uh, the average is one week, seven days, uh, is because of the immunosuppression uh, adjustment uh, and because I want to remove uh, the Foley catheter myself, uh, and I do that on post-operative day seven. So, so far, I have to say that whether I do it robotically or open, uh, my patients do not leave the hospital before seven days. In the future, I think that uh, if we demonstrate that the pain is much lower and the patient is doing fine, I think that we can reduce the hospital stay. Um, do you measure the temperature on the surface of the kidney? How often do you replace the melt ice? This is a great question. Um, if you look at the paper from uh, Manny Menon and Rajesh Alawat, that's what they do. So they constantly uh, 
measure with a temperature needle the surface of the kidney. That's very important uh, because with that uh, you realize that the temperature flashes very much. So uh, unless you constantly pour ice inside the peritoneum. My experience is that uh, if you pour ice uh, then you do the vein anastomosis, uh, by 15 minutes at the time the temperature starts to rise up again. And so it, at that time, that's why I said during my presentation, after the venous anastomosis, I pour ice inside the abdomen again. And with that, uh, it gives me, it gives me uh, extra 15 to 20 minutes uh, of constant temperature. Again, we are working on some mechanism uh, which is not pouring ice inside the abdomen. Sooner or later, we will have some severe hypothermia of the recipient uh, because of the ice drop inside of the uh, peritoneum. But as I said, we are working on defining instruments or devices that will provide a constant cooling to the kidney, isolating the kidney from the peritoneum. But so far, yes, we measure the, the intraoperative uh, um, uh, temperatures uh, uh, with a temperature needle. Um, so far, this is what we have been doing. Lately, I have to say that we have not been doing this because we have already demonstrated uh, how it works, and therefore we know that after 15 minutes we have to pour ice on top of the kidney, and that's enough. Um, I mean a bladder with very small capacity. Yes, this is a, <laughs> the, 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 the following question related to uh, the bladder with very small capacity. And again, if the bladder is with very small capacity, but you are able to demonstrate uh, that before the surgery, uh, before the renal insufficiency, the, pain, the, the bladder was a normal capacity and it has become uh, of small capacity be because of the anuria, that's fine. If before the surgery was a small capacity bladder or high pressure bladder by urodynamics, uh, then you need to, to either replace the, the bladder with an augmented bladder or with an iliac conduit. Do you completely extraperitonealize the graft? Yes, the answer is yes. Uh, as I said in my presentation, uh, we initially perform uh, a retroperitoneal pouch and then once the anastomosis is done, we flip the kidney on top of the psoas uh, and then we retroperitonealize uh, with a couple of hemologs uh, the, the, the kidney. And because of this, I have to say, this, this is something that the open surgeons, uh, including myself, uh, learn from uh, the robotic uh, experience. Uh, because of the fact that we are working intraperitoneally, and then we, we leave a huge open window from the retroperitoneum uh, to the intraperitoneal space. Uh, in, this in this series of 32 kidney transplants, robotic kidney transplants, uh, we have not seen uh, a single lymphocyl. And the same experience is with the Rajesh Alawat and Many Manon database, uh, um, which, in which it appears uh, that the lymphocytes uh, are really a rare event, unlike open surgery when they count for 10 to 20 percent in certain series. Uh, um, and I think that, that in open surgery we are used to go directly to the retroperitoneum and keep the retroperitoneum closed. In fact, if we open uh, a window, uh, a peritoneal window, we normally suture the peritoneum. Um, so you would argue that you can do the same thing in open surgery and open uh, a huge peritoneal uh, window. But uh, we have never been doing this so far, so we don't have this, uh, this answer. In robotic sur surgery, since we do it open, uh, we have the answer, and the lymphocyte goes down. Um, some question. How do you usually close the peritoneal flap? By hemologs. So the flap, there are two tents. One is uh, you know, towards uh, the patient head, and the other one is towards the pubis. And then when the kidney is retroperitonealized, you, 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 you flip the two tents on top of the kidney and you just simply place a couple of hemologs. Do you use a running barb suture or hemologs? I just answered this. And I use a barb suture to retroperitonealize the bladder, which I like to do. Like the experience with prostatectomy, there are people arguing that it's a better recovery. I think it makes sense. If you retroperitonealize the bladder and you have a urine leak at the anastomosis, then the urine leak, uh, it's retroperitoneal, and you have less urine contact with the bowel, which I think um, it, it helps. Uh, how long do you prepare the ureter before placing the graft intracorporeal? 
uh, I think how long it's in the bench table so um, it's just uh, right before uh, entering so the way it works in my institution is I have two rooms in one room we are doing uh, the laparoscopic donor nephrectomy at the, the same time in the other room there's a uh, one of my assistants uh, usually is uh, Dr. Luis Gausa, uh, who is preparing uh, all the vessels, the bladder, and the retroperitoneal pouch. And when he's ready and I'm ready, I take the kidney out. And then I do the bench, bench table, so then when I go in the room, uh, after 20, 30 minutes of preparation of the kidney, uh, we are already ready, and the kidney goes in directly. So I think it's 30 minutes before the reimplantation that the ureter is prepared. Um, and the other one is, do you use a temperature monitor of the graft during the procedure or just cooling uh, with syringes? Uh, well, this is I already answered. Thank you, Vital. Um, for the ar arterial failure, your two cases, uh, did you revise the suture or the remove, remove the, the, I'm sorry, did you revise the suture or remove the, the transplant kidney? Well, in both cases, the transplant kidney was removed. Uh, and I have to tell you that, uh, at least in my case, uh, I didn't find uh, uh, the hole on the artery, on the iliac artery, too lateral. It was lateral, but it was not too lateral. But yes, on CT scan, we could see the kinking. So I think that it was uh, really a technical mistake from my side. And I, and I had to remove the kidney. I mean, it was, uh, I went in uh, hoping to save it, but of course, when there's arterial thrombosis, the majority of the time is a removal. You told the lymphocyl rare the rate is low in robotic transplantation. Can you please explain why? I think I just explained why, um, and I think it makes sense. You know, uh, the lymphocyl rate is low because it's intraperitoneal. The surgery is totally intraperitoneal, and even the kidney is left uh, with a huge intraperitoneal window. Therefore, the lymphocyl is low. Again, I think that you could do the same in open. So it's not a, a merit of robotic surgery other than the merit of robotic surgery is that we discovered uh, that because of this uh, we have uh, less lymphocytes. And I think this is the reason and the only reason. The other, actually not the only reason, the other reason that I'm speculating again uh, is that um, you know what we dissect the arteries uh, in line with the artery. So we really do not cut lymphatics. Uh, we just open a sort of uh, you know uh, a window on the vessels. Uh, that might be something uh, that you may argue that you can do also in open, but in open, the majority of the times you try to expose as minimal as possible the vessels. In here, you really extend your dissection almost to the common iliacs uh, and almost to the pubis. Uh, so you have the entire external iliac and sometimes also the internal. You see it, in fact, the internal iliac is my um, proximal margin of dissection uh, that is totally exposed. Uh, so I think that this is really the only reason why we see few lymphocytes also. Um, other question, do you experience a multiple renal artery? Yes. Uh, uh, to be honest with you, I don't recommend to start with two or three arteries. Uh, but we have performed uh, two or three arteries. Uh, um, and it depends. This is like in open surgery. If the arteries, uh, if you have two arteries uh, and they are same equal size, uh, then we do a pair of pants. So we put them uh, together. Um, side to side. If we have uh, a small artery and larger artery, I like to do a terminal lateral anastomosis on the main renal artery. Um, the other thing is that uh, keep in mind that uh, one of the advantages of the robotic surgery is that uh, the right kidney with a very short vein, uh, even those with a very short vein, vein are easy stuff. Um, the kidney is down there. Uh, so if you have two arteries on the left and one artery on the right, uh, in open surgery, I normally tend to prefer the left kidney over the right. Because in open, a very short vein, sometimes it bothers me. Uh, although I do it, but sometimes it bothers me. In robotic, uh, it's exactly the opposite. Uh, if you have two arteries on the left and, a short, uh, and one artery on the right, uh, even if the vein is short, uh, I take the right out. And that's because the vein uh, is close to the iliac vein and you do the anastomosis right there and the robot helps very much with this. But yes, I, I did uh, uh, at least three cases that I recall with two arteries. Um, is a prospective randomized trial 
statistically planned and due to low case load realistic? Um, this is a good question. So um, it is really planned. So far, there are two databases that I know. One is the Vaticuti database from Manny Menon and Rajesh Alawat in Detroit. They are recruiting op uh, robotic transplants in a prospective manner and they already have over 400 cases included. This is a good one and these are good numbers. Our just started and within a few seconds we got 32 cases and more are coming. I think we will recruit cases from uh, uh, Turkey and also from Spain. More cases are possibly coming and there are more centers st starting. So the answer to your question is uh, at the beginning, uh, so far, we are looking at prospective data solely related to robotic transplantation. And as soon as we can demonstrate uh, that it is feasible and that the results are compared uh, or comparable to open surgery, then of course I think that the prospective uh, randomized uh, study will be the next step. And I can assure you that Rajesh Alawal, many men and myself are working very hard on this. Uh, and I think it will be possible in within the next future, not so far from today. Um, let me see, there are other questions. Do you have any experience with laparoscopic transplantation? No, none, but at my center there was a, a, a physician uh, uh, performing laparoscopic transplantation. Um, I think he was very successful and uh, granted he's a very talented uh, laparoscopic surgeon but I think that uh, the main limitation of laparoscopy in this is that it's not reproducible. Uh, robotic surgery is reproducible and as soon as you have experience with robot, robotic and with transplant you can do the surgery. If you have experience with laparoscopy and transplant uh, I'm not sure if you can do laparoscopic transplantation. I think it's very stressful, but the, the, the answer to this is I have no experience with laparoscopic transplantation. What about vaginal insertion? All right, so um, you know that uh, uh, Nicolas Dumerc um, and I think also um, Antonio Alcaraz from uh, Barcelona, they have uh, performed this uh, in a very successful way. And I think uh, again it's a possible way to perform it. I have to tell you that I am very concerned on the uh, vaginal uh, uh, way um, to extract the kidney possibly less than to insert the kidney. The vagina is not sterile and as much as we want to clean the vagina there must be germs around. Um, I'm not sure if I'm happy of uh, introducing uh, a kidney even if I place the gel port um, through the vagina. So um, the answer is the data will tell us because there are people investigating on this uh, um, and so far I think that uh, my favorite way is via the gel port uh, and the incision is very minimal. So the other reason uh, not to insert the, the kidney through the vagina is that you have to insert it in a bag and then you have to spend time to um, uh, open the bag to take the kidney out. And if you don't insert it in a bag, then again, uh, you're exposing the kidney to a higher risk of infection. So I don't know. Um, again, speculation uh, is all I'm doing right now. So, But uh, again, uh, these surgeons that I mentioned uh, are working on this and they will give us some uh, results. Uh, other question. With aroma plaque on CT, uh, uh, you always make open surgery? Uh, no, not always. Uh, it depends on how big is the ateroma. Of course, if you have a full uh, iliac artery full of uh, ateromas, yes, then I go open. If there's a couple of plaques and I'm able to identify those on CT scan, then I have no problem going in robotically. But there are some cases, especially in the disease population, where the ateroma is so big and is so diffuse that you certainly don't want to put a bulldog laparoscopically or robotically in, but you want to put your, put your hands in there and just palpate the best space to perform your arteriotomy and the clamping. What do you think about VLOC? Uh, VLOC for the anastomosis? Uh, mm, I don't think it's good in vascular surgery to, to use VLOC. I would be much, much afraid of uh, tearing, especially of the vein. Um, I wouldn't like it. Um, what is the biggest uh, contraindication for a robotic transplantation? Well, again, I think the biggest contraindication uh, is when you have a lot of ateroma. Um, 
and of course if you have already three or four transplants in. So in that situation it might be uh, better uh, to go in open and it makes your life easier. Uh, and also <clears throat> if there are huge polycystic kidneys uh, and you don't want to take the kidneys out, uh, uh, then a reduced space uh, due to the polycystic kidneys uh, might be a challenge uh, because the space inside is really minimal and so you want to have a little bit of freedom of movement. Uh, uh, so in that case uh, it's possibly better to stay totally retroperitoneal. Uh, do you have any case that you performed uh, uh, artery anastomosis in another vessel like internal iliac artery? Uh, Listen, I've done over 1,200 uh, uh, kidney transplants in my life, uh, open and robotic, and I have never used internal iliac artery. Um, I don't like it. Uh, I don't think it's uh, bad. I just think I don't like it. I know that there are many surgeons used to that. Uh, I'm not, so I've never done it. But I'm sure that one time it will happen. Normally, I don't like to use the internal because uh, even if it's free of calcification at the moment, uh, usually it's in young people where, we, where you do that. Uh, with time you can get a lot of calcifications, more than the external, so I don't normally like to ligate the internal. And then there's also some pain related to the ligation of the internal, so I normally don't like to use it. All right. I'm sorry, the question that I mean, how many centimeter length of ureter did you prepare before putting the graft inside? Okay, yes, I understand your question, Nevia. Um, Yes, it's, it's a good question. So uh, the question is, uh, if you place a double J stent uh, um, uh, before you put the kidney inside the patient, uh, then you might have uh, a longer ureter uh, than needed uh, or a shorter ureter. So how do you cut the ureter? And realistically speaking, uh, in my experience at least, uh, the ureter is never too short. It's always too long. And therefore, I like to cut the ureter as short as possible because I think that that's a very nice way to prevent stricture. So normally, I like to, if I cut the ureter at the iliac vessels in a, in a laparoscopic donor nephrectomy, and then I cut it in the open uh, bench table. I cut it. I cut two centimeter and spatulate one cent, one to two centimeter. So usually, it's a ten centimeter urethral length. In fact, I place a twelve centimeter, four point eight French. Uh, pediatric uh, double J inside, and I hope I answered your question with top. Um, uh, do you think that the cold ischemia time between harvest and introduction should be as short as possible? Uh, I don't know. There are people, uh, and we are we are doing it. To be honest with you, we are doing a, a, a kidney chain and the kidney travels in an, air, in, a, in an airplane for two, three hours. When I was in Los Angeles, we, we would ship kidneys from Los Angeles, live donor kidneys from Los Angeles to New York. That's eight hours, and the kidney function is perfect. So I don't think that the cold ischemia time is really very important. Um, I think that the warm ischemia time, or the rewarming, is really very important. Uh, if you use hemolox, uh, then the retroperitoneum is not completely closed. Therefore, a lymphocyte seems uh, automatically drained to the abdomen. Yes, exactly. That is, in fact, uh, the explanation, uh, the transperitoneal window. That's exactly what I said before. And I think that this was the last question. So for those of you that are still present, uh, again, uh, thank you very much for this uh, um, time. I hope that I answered uh, some of your questions, and I hope that you liked uh, um, the way we are uh, doing our research on kidney transplantation. And for any question, please do not hesitate to contact me. Um, my email is online, uh, and so I'll be more than happy to answer to your questions. Uh, and remember that within one month, you will get in the surgery motion uh, all the answers uh, that you're missing today and the video on the step-by-step -step procedure. Thank you again, uh, and goodbye to everybody.